So um, I was born in the Netherlands to Ghanaian parents. So originally I'm from Ghana and I grew up in many places in the world. I grew up in the Netherlands. I grew up uh, partly in Ghana, partly in France, and I currently reside in the United Kingdom. I'm an early years teacher. Mm -hmm. I teach um, mainly preschool children, age three to four. I found out I'm, I was autistic when I was working in a secondary school as the head of English as an additional language. Mm -hmm. I had a boy from Turkey who was um, given to me to look after. He was quite a brilliant boy, but he was underachieving because he couldn't really access the curriculum. They felt that his problem was because he was um, new to English, but mm. his English was actually um, good. He was quite perfect. Mm. But I could see that there were some discrepancies with his social interaction mm. and that um, hampered on his progress. I tried to get the Senko to take him under his wing, but the mm -hmm. Senko said, no, he's from Turkey, he's from abroad, he's your problem. So I decided to keep him. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody suggested that he might have what we call Asperger's syndrome because mm -hmm. he was very literal. Mm -hmm. Everything you tell him, you just take it literally. And he was obsessed with um, computers and um, mobile phone operating systems, nanotechnology, things like that. And he would talk for hours on end, I decided to look out for what Asperger's syndrome was so I, I could help him better. Mm -hmm. And I came across a book from Dr. Tony Atwood, mm -hmm. which was um, Asperger's Syndrome Handbook. As I began to read this book, my whole life began to unravel right in front of me. Mm -hmm my childhood, all the times I spent without friends, my um, obsessions and all my quirks, where everything was being explained in the book, not just giving examples, but actually telling me why I was behaving that way, what was going on in my brain. So I wasn't actually learning about this little boy, I was learning about myself. That's mm -hmm. when I began my journey to find out um, about my autism and to um, actually pursue a diagnosis. Now it took me five years from that point mm -hmm. until I got my diagnosis because they didn't want to um, grant me a diagnosis. They didn't want to um, assess me because I was high functioning, as they said, I had a job, I had a family, um, I, I was independent. So. And because of that, they don't want to um, grant me the assessment. So tell me a little bit more, more about yourself and particularly you presumably you had to study, get a degree and then study to become a teacher. Tell me about some of the problems that you had because of your condition with doing that. I started um, with um, from kindergarten. That's a ver at very um, early age. And apparently I repeated the kindergarten four times because I didn't know why I was there. I wasn't making any friends. I wasn't um, doing any of the exercises I was meant to do. I wasn't engaging with the class. And um, I was bullied a lot um, by my peers. I was even bullied um, by family members. Um, and they were laughing at me and I didn't really understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to France, that's when I began to um, get a feel of friendships because um, unlike in Ghana, where everyone had to be the same, in mm. France, uh, my individuality was more embraced. And when I came back to Ghana after four years, I had developed some social skills, mm. which I used for my survival. Mm -hmm. But now I didn't have many friends, but I could study. At the secondary school level, um, I got really good grades mm. and I was able to progress to university. Mm -hmm. At the university level, I faced a little bit of challenge because at the secondary school level, I relied on memory. But at the university level, there are different types of um, questions mm -hmm. um, and you, different type of skills and cognitive skills that you have to apply. I didn't do very, very well at the um, degree, at, mm -hmm. during my first degree at the university. Mm -hmm. So, What, what masters did you do then? Oh, yeah, I recently completed a master's degree in um, early childhood studies because I branched into um, early teaching. That's another story altogether. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I tried to become a French teacher. 
but I faced lots of barriers. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that my disability had a, a, an impact mm -hmm. in, in all the barriers I faced. I thought it was just um, me and mm -hmm. <laughs> I just tried to work harder, but nothing was working. It was a PGC, Postgraduate Certificate in Education. Mm -hmm. I experienced lots of sensory overloads in the classrooms, um, lots of misbehavior from the um, students. Mm. And um, you would think that because it's an educational institution, they would easily pick up on the fact that I was displaying signs or traits of autism, but no, they didn't. Probably they did, but they swept it under the carpet or something. But the long and short was that I ended up failing the course. I fell out with my um, mentor at one of the schools at my final placement, and she recommended that um, they fail me. Like It was just a waste of money because I didn't get anything. I was even um, suicidal. I did a few odd jobs until I got a job as a teaching assistant at one of the schools, a language teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. And I worked my way up to become the head of the English of um, English as an additional language. But once I was there, I stayed there for about five years. And a friend of mine told me about a course, an early year teacher status course. Mm -hmm. And I liked working with children. So I just branched into it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I became an early years teacher. I got the EYT. That's a level you six course. That. You, you yeah, I passed that. that, yeah. Because by then I knew I was autistic. So mm -hmm. I made a declaration, I made a disclosure, but I wasn't officially diagnosed, but everyone was really nice and supportive to me. And they gave me all the support I could get. And I ended up passing the course. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're working in a, an early years setting or is it a school uh, that you work it's, it's at? It's a setting, it's an early year setting. But you are the nursery teacher, yeah? I'm the nursery teacher, yes. Okay. And uh, so tell me some of the barriers that you're still finding now that you are a nursery teacher. For example, multitasking. Um, as an early years teacher, I'm expected to be able to teach, to control the um, children, to um, have eyes everywhere, to be looking to see what everyone is doing, to be making observations and um, to be feeding the children, to be changing um, them in case they soil themselves or so many things at once. Mm -hmm. But um, the nursery can be such a noisy environment mm -hmm. and I can only focus on one thing at a time, one child at a time. So sometimes you find me working with just one child mm -hmm. and sometimes they, I see that they're drawing um, comparisons between myself and the previous early years teacher who happened to be neurotypical and who could um, function um, whilst there was so much noise. I can do that. When there's so much noise, when there's so many children running helter skelter, um, my brain sort of freezes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I become really quiet. It wasn't until recently that um, I had to make a declaration about my um, autism. Yes, yeah, to, mm. um, to the staff, not to all the staff, mm. but I faced a problem at work recently mm. where um, I had a, a meltdown. Mm. It wasn't, um, yeah, it was, I'll say it's a meltdown, yeah. It was more of a sensory overload. Mm. So many things happened um, from the day, from the minute I left my home, so many things happened on the road, things happened, there was a change of routine within mm. um, the nursery and in the and the children were not listening to me and I had to really raise my voice. I saw red and um, after that disciplinary measures um, came into place mm. and I, I got a, a letter from the um, management saying that uh, you're still under probation yet um, what you've done right now is um, classified as gross misconduct. So we're going to have to um, send you home for a while whilst investigation take place. I had to contact the National Autistic Society. I had to contact a, an organization called um, Calm and um, Hope Line, which deals with um, people with suicidal ideation to um, um, advise me. And what I got from this was that I need to make a declaration yeah. because they didn't know. And I didn't want to. Um, declared because I want to initially declare it during my interview stage, but that opportunity didn't come. Yeah. So um, when I made a declaration- When you put, filled in the application form, you didn't put it down. There was nothing like um, autism. Um, there was a, 
tick box for depression and anxiety, which I ticked. It was another tick box for um, the medication yeah. you take, and I put in my Prozac and uh, Fluoxetine. So, yeah. so when you did, when you made the declaration, did their attitude to you change? Uh, oh yes, that? everything changed because I was on the way out. Mm. I'd received a suspension letter. My mm. um, key fob was taken away from me. I was told not to come back into the certain until um, and the. HR would call me. So immediately I spoke to the National Autistic Society. I called the, uh, my manager and told him that, told her that I need to make a disclosure. Due to that, they changed their whole procedure. They said that, okay, in that case, um, carrying on with the disciplinary procedure will not be appropriate. So we're gonna have an informal meeting with you to try to understand um, where you're coming from and to let you also understand our concern because eventually you're working with children and if you're working with children um, we want to be reassured that you are competent enough you have the capability to work with children so during that meeting I had the opportunity to sell myself all over again mm. and they welcomed me back by the end of the week they say yes um, you're welcome to come back so oh, that's okay. a really interesting story now Tell me the last bit I want to get um, is what are the, some of the barriers that you face? You've got a family, I take it. Um, yes. Uh, bringing up the family and what are some of the barriers that you face just traveling around in the outside environment? What are the, some of the things that you find difficult as someone with autism? One problem I have is um, directions. Mm. Yeah, because um, I can attend the place many on many occasions, but I'll still lose my way yeah. because I've got something called place blindness. Also, um, I have a problem with people's faces as well. When I meet someone, let's say from work mm. in a shop, I wouldn't be able to place that person's face in context immediately. Oh. I normally have a pen on me, so I do lots of writing. I write mm. things down so I don't forget. Mm. Do you have any tricks that you can use for lowering your uh, the sensory overload that you get from these things? What can you do to deal with um, that? With sensory overload, um, I could use things like um, earplugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in case the overload is auditory, I've always got um, earplugs on me in my pocket over here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've got earplugs. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've got my ear defenders as well ear attached defense. to my bag. Yeah, so they're always handy. Yeah. For looking to the future, what things do we need to have in place as a society as a whole to make life easier for people like you? Okay, at the moment, there's not much out there because um, autism is an invisible condition. Yeah. Um, right now, there's an awareness that not all um, disabilities are visible. If you go to shops, there's this um, lanyard which um, is um, readily available. Once they see that you're wearing it, the shop assistants can come and ask you, do you need any help? Because once you have it, it identifies you as someone with an invisible condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, also, some of the public places are doing um, schemes like um, Autism Hour where lights are lowered and music is toned down for people on the spectrum to be able to um, function and to enjoy the atmosphere in those places, such as shops and cinemas and other places like that. Workplaces are becoming more um, and more aware. They're putting in place um, accommodations mm -hmm. to, um, mm -hmm. to curb the instances of sensory overload. It's, it's gonna be a long journey but we eventually get there if we take it one step at a time. What we need to do as a society is to listen to autistic people because there's a proverb that he who wears the shoe knows where it pinches.